thank you all for having me here uh, this is uh, for me this is a pleasure to prepare this little short presentation um, before we start I just want to uh, kind of say that uh, I'll give you a little background about myself I'm an ophthalmologist I've been here in the States for about 50 years I graduated from a medical school in Bihar and then came to States uh, I also have a background in pathology. I teach at the medical school and I also see patients. I'm a general ophthalmologist. Uh, as you all know, there are some specialties in ophthalmology, retina, etc., etc. Um, so if I have a complicated problem, I send those patients to the subspecialist. What I plan to do here today is to give you a very basic introduction to some of the common eye problems that we see and uh, I see among our uh, friends here, um, and these problems are common in India. So I thought I'll share some information. I kept it very basic and very visual so it's easy to understand uh, without getting too technical. Uh, before I start my presentation, the way I have put it together, there are about 50 slides, should take me about 30 minutes. Uh, first seven, eight slides are just a basic introduction to how the eyes work. Uh, in general. You, I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of the stuff, but I thought I'll just uh, restate it. And then I'm going to go over, I picked four major problems of the eyes, uh, and I'll go through each one of them. Uh, and then there is a fifth one at the end if we have time. And then some of you did send me a set of questions. Uh, I have prepared short responses to those. So at the end of my presentation, we'll have plenty of time to go over those questions. And I'll try to answer those the best I can. Okay, so I think with that, we can get started. I'm going to walk you through all the slides and talk through all the slides. Like I said, first seven, eight slides are just an introduction to how the eyes work. And I'll try to make it a little bit interesting and uh, share some other things. This is the way I teach medical school uh, students uh, about the eye. So the second slide, uh, if I can advance it, is an audio uh, video. Vision is one of the most important senses. The eye's main function is to detect light patterns and partner with the brain to translate light into images that we see and perceive. The eye is a complex optical system very similar to a camera. Much like a camera lens, the lens in the eye focuses light onto the retina at the back of the eye. The retina functions as the film in the eye's camera, capturing incoming light rays from objects and sending them to the brain to be developed as an image. Let's explore the eye's lens and film and get a closer look at the structures in between that allow us to see. The process of vision begins when light rays bounce off an object and enter the eye through the cornea, the clear, dome-shaped front window of the eye. Similar to a lens on a camera, the cornea is a powerful refractive surface responsible for about 70% of the eye's focusing power. It is the cornea that enables us to see clearly. After traveling through the clear cornea, the light rays reach the iris and pupil. The iris is that distinctively colored part of your eye that you see in the mirror. The pupil is the small opening in the center of the iris that acts like an aperture in a camera. As muscles in the iris relax and constrict, the pupil changes size to adjust the amount of light entering the eye. The more light your eye is exposed to, the smaller the pupil gets. If there is low light, the pupil enlarges to allow more light in. After passing through the pupil opening, the light rays reach the lens. This transparent, flexible structure uses tiny muscles and fibers to change its shape and thickness, allowing the eye to converge the light rays. This refractive power gives us the ability to change our focus from objects close to us to far away in the distance, then back again. After the light rays exit the back side of the lens, they proceed through a gel-like substance in the center of the eye called the vitreous humor. The vitreous helps the eye maintain its spherical form and shape. 
Finally, the light rays converge to a focal point on the retina's surface. The retina is the part of the eye similar to film in a camera. It is a very light-sensitive and complex tissue, wallpapering most of the inner wall of the eyeball. It is filled with hundreds of millions of receptor cells that capture the light rays, convert them into electrical impulses, and transmit them through an intricate system of nerve fibers to the optic nerve. These electrical impulses then travel along the optic nerve to the brain, where they are interpreted as the images we see. I hope you all got to see that. Um, so, eyes, you know, we have five major sensory organs in the body, and the eyes are the most important of all these to the point that about 65-70% of our brain activity is connected to our eyes. Uh, that's how important it is. So eyes come in different shapes and size uh, across the, uh, the animal kingdom, as just like cameras do. Just, to, just out of interest, I'm going to show you a couple. The largest eyeballs are in a shark, uh, about 12 inches, a foot wide, while a human eye is about one inch wide. And these are dissimilar to our human eyes. On the other hand, flies have what are known as compound eyes. These are very basic, simple structures uh, which cannot see anything in detail. If this fly is looking at this child's face, all it sees is shadows. And that's all the fly is interested in because it wants to fly away as soon as it detects any movement. So it, it's a tremendous variation in the structure, in the size, and the shape of the eyes. In fact, even the number of eyes can vary. Humans have two eyes. Uh, there are uh, cyclops are really stillborn monsters. Have one eye. Uh, in our mythology, Shiva had three eyes. Um, they have found uh, old fish fossils with five eyes, so that varies. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Now, the way the two eyes work, as it said in the video, it's like two cameras. They take pictures, for example, of this rose here, and both eyes, some of the uh, what they see overlaps in the middle. And that signal is processed in the back of the eye, the light signal, in a place called macula, and then it's transmitted to the back part of our brain, at the back all the way, so-called the occipital lobe, where the interpretation of that signal takes place and we actually see the image of whatever we are looking at, for example, this rose, with the back part of our brain. It's not the eyes. The eyes just capture the picture, but do not do any interpretation of what we are looking at. Okay, next slide. Okay, now you all familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum. In that spectrum, the visible light occupies a very small portion of it. Human eyes can see that light between 370 to about 770 wavelength, nanometers. There are some animals, birds especially, that can see a little wider spectrum, but most of us can only see within that spectrum. This light ray, as it enters the eye, for example here, it enters the eye, it goes to the back part of our eyeball called, there's a place called macula uh, and retina, that's the inside lining of the eyeballs. Now the retina and the macula contain what are known as photoreceptors. They capture the light and convert that into a signal. So these are the photoreceptor cells. There are two types of these. One is 120 million photoreceptors are the rods, which are important for visualizing things in a dim light when there is not enough light, for example, at night. Then there is a small number of photoreceptors called cones. There are six million of them in each eye. That is responsible for the sharpest vision we have. And it's also responsible for all the colors that we appreciate. So when later I talk about problems of the macula or diabetes, these cones become very critical. If they are damaged, that will affect our sight. Uh, and as I said earlier, the actual interpretation takes in the back part of our brain in the visual cortex. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
maybe I can advance it myself. Okay. Um, I said earlier, you know, there is slight variation in, in the eyes of different animals. Now, the cones that I mentioned are responsible for the color perception. And there are three types of cones, each one of recognizes a different wavelength, usually red, blue, and green. That's in the human eyes. In some birds and animals and insects, they have cones that are restricted to two colors. Colors. Rarely does any animal have cones that can recognize four different colors. This is similar to what we see in a color television. The pixels are basically three basic colors uh, and then it's a mixture of all these. So there are six million of these in each eye. So between the two eyes we have 250 million rods and 12 million cones. Uh, the birds, some birds can see beyond the ultraviolet range, while well, humans cannot. So that's important for them, especially at night. Okay, let me see. I want, to, I want to see if I can move the slide myself. No, I can't. Okay, go ahead. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I bring this up here uh, to make us aware of one thing, very fundamental thing. And uh, I don't need to go into great detail. This is what I try to convey to my students that eyes are responsible for what we see, but the amount of things that we see in our real world is very little. So for their uh, education, actually, I brought this up. I said, okay, let's look at the universe. It's 14 billion years old. And I some, sat down one day and calculated what would be the size of it based on the speed of light. I came up with that huge number Compare that to the diameter of the Earth, which is only 8,000 miles. Now, there are 15 million, trillion cells in each human body. Our intestinal system contains a lot of bacteria, estimated at 15 trillion. Just for reference, the U.S. debt today or last year was 30 trillion. Now, we only have 126 million rods and cones in each eye. Those photoreceptors are responsible for visualizing whatever we see around us. And all said and done, we can only see 4% of what exists out there in nature. Majority of that, 96% is not visible to human eyes. And yet, it is amazing what we can see with our eyes. Um, most of what we have in the universe is what called dark energy and dark matter. We can't see it, but we know it's there. You, you you will be familiar with this, but a lot of my students are just not aware of this. I just wanted to mention it to them to make them aware of it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, there are four topics that I have picked. And for reference, I'm going to show you what parts of the eyes are involved. We talk about cataracts. <clears throat> the cataracts involve the lens that's behind the color part. We talk about glaucoma that affects the nerve that connects the eyeball to the brain. We talk about macular degeneration that affects this small area in the back of the eye called macula. And that's where most of those cones are concentrated. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about diabetic uh, retinopathy, which affects the retina, which is the inside lining of the eyeball. So these are four major topics I'm going to talk about. Uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, and if you have time, I may talk about retinitis pigmentosa. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so just to give you an idea, uh, the extent of eye problems, blindness that exists in the world and some numbers about India. This is, um, these numbers are probably from year 2004. So they're still valid today. Global causes of blindness. As you can see, most common reason for blindness is cataract. Same thing in India. And fortunately, this is a reversible cause of blindness. You take the cataract out and person should be able to see unless there is some other issue in the eye. We talk about uncorrected refractive error. That's the second most cause. That can be fixed with glasses, contact lenses, sometimes surgery. So most of the reasons why people are blind globally can be re uh, fixed. It's reversible. Then we have other reasons why people go blind. Glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and some other small issues. Out of all this group, 
If you look at India, for example, the most common cause of blindness is uh, cataracts. Reversible, but the resources are not there to help most of them. Refractive error meaning glasses, which most people can have access to. Glaucoma is something I will talk about a little more in detail. Uh, and when I talk about other causes, that includes diabetic retinopathy. So in India, it's estimated there are about 25, 30 million people who are blind. Majority of that can be helped uh, if they had access to resources. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So these are the four topics I'm going to talk about. Diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, cataracts, and macular degeneration. Okay, let's move on. Next slide. Okay, diabetic eye disease, the thing to understand about diabetes is that it destroys small blood vessels throughout the body, not just the eyes. Fortunately, eyes are the only place in the body where we can actually visualize those blood vessels without cutting into anything. And elsewhere in the body, we have to cut into the body tissue to see those blood vessels. So we can look into the eyes and see what's happening to these small blood vessels in a patient with diabetes. And the problem in diabetes is that these blood vessels are damaged, so the flow of blood through those blood vessels is interrupted, and that causes all kinds of problems. Okay, next slide. So, give you an idea of how common this is. The, globally, there are about 400 million people with diabetes. This number is going to be 50% more, 600 million in the next 10 years. About 100 million people have problems uh, in their eyes from diabetes. 30% of them risk going completely blind if they are not taken care of. And there are two types of diabetes, I will not get into that. But these numbers correlate with what's happening in India. Here is an estimate in year 2011, there were 53 million diabetics in India, uh, about 3 million had diabetic retinopathy. And that number will go up in 2030 to about 70 million diabetics and 10% of them will risk going, to bl uh, going blind unless something is done about their uh, diabetic retinopathy. Okay, move on to the next slide. So, as I said, diabetes causes damage of the small blood vessels. Here is a view of the small capillary blood vessels in the back of the eye. These blood vessels get damaged. Now, what are the risk factors for patients who have diabetes of, going, uh, of developing diabetic retinopathy? The most important is how long they've had diabetes. First five, 10 years, usually nothing happens, or at least we don't see it. Uh, but after 10 years of diabetes, and especially if it is poorly controlled diabetes, and when I say poorly controlled, it has to be controlled 24-7 um, in order to provide protection. It will not prevent, but it will delay the development of what we call retinopathy. So I have patients who are 40, 50 years, uh, they have had diabetes and their eyes are perfectly fine. On the other hand, sometimes I see a patient who is just diagnosed with diabetes with significant problem in their eyes. So it's a matter of how well they've controlled their blood sugar, how long they've had it. Other risk factors, a lot of these patients have other uh, problems, health issues, such as high blood pressure, they might have kidney problems, uh, obesity, high uh, cholesterol levels, they might be smoking, other issues. They will all incre increase the risk of getting what we call retinopathy. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you some pictures of what we see inside the eyes of these patients as this retinopathy develops. So the, this is a scanning electron micrograph of the, the small capillaries in the back of the eye. These are normal in this case. So when these get damaged, we start seeing initially very tiny spots of bleeding that you see here which we call very mild diabetic retinopathy. Just to orient you, this is a view of the inside of the eyeball. Here is the macula. We'll be talking about that later. And this is the nerve, optic nerve, which gets damaged in glaucoma. This is macula. And the, all the red 
uh, uh, is the retina. And here are tiny blood uh, t dots of blood. That's a bleeding. That's how initially it starts. These blood vessels break and they bleed. Over time, not only do they bleed, but they start leaking some fluid that contains a lot of fatty lipid material. That's what that white stuff is. It keeps accumulating. As it gets worse, you see more of that. And you see more of the bleeding back here. And this is a severe case. There is extensive swelling of the retina, a lot of these lipid exudates and a lot of hemorrhage. So far, this is what is known as non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I'm not gonna get technical, but this is still a treatable stage of diabetes. The next slide I'm going to show you is where we really develop complications that cannot be fixed easily. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is what is known as a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So let me back up a little bit. When these capillaries are damaged, the retina is poorly perfused, so it doesn't get enough oxygen. If the retina doesn't develop enough oxygen, it gets the signal that the circulation is poor. It starts making or opening up new blood vessels in order to improve the blood flow and delivery of oxygen to the retina. So these new blood vessels are called, um, the process is called neovascularization. So these are new fragile blood vessels that develop inside the back of the eye. These arrows point to those fragile new blood vessels. These are very fragile. They break very easily and they bleed. So when they break, we get extensive amount of hemorrhage inside the eye in the retina. This is already getting to, to a stage where we have problem uh, treating these uh, patients. And eventually when this blood goes away after six months, 12 months, it leaves behind an extensive amount of scar tissue which permanently damages the retina. This is where these patients permanently go blind. In the United States, this is the most common cause of permanent blindness in patients between the age of 20 and 50. Right in the middle and prime of their life, they go permanently blind. And this process can take 5, 10, 20 years, or it can happen within two years. It's a little bit unpredictable, depending on what other risk factors the patients have. So our whole goal in treating diabetic retinopathy is to prevent this and fix it as early as we can. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the way we treat diabetic retinopathy depends on what stage it is. Initially, we do what is known as argon laser treatment. So these spots that you see are spots of laser spots, thousands of these laser spots. We want to preserve macula. This is macula. We want to preserve that, but we don't care about the rest of the retina away from that. These, this is a thermal energy that's applied to the retina and it actually destroys the retina and takes away the tissue that promotes new blood vessel formation. So uh, initially, this is what we would do. If it gets to the uh, point where we starting to see new blood vessels, and especially if they're bleeding, we want to prevent those new blood vessels from forming. So they give intra, uh, uh, what they call intravitreous injections of anti-VEGF factors. Anti-VEGF prevents the formation of new blood vessels. And then, if they reach the final stage of scar tissue formation, extensive hemorrhage, we actually have to go in and clean out all that blood and the scar tissue. Often this doesn't work very well, sometimes it helps, but we want to try and avoid this stage of retinopathy. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the anti-VEGF factors I talked about, uh, I'll show you in a minute what those are when I talk about macular degeneration. So the key to preventing diabetic eye disease is control your blood sugar and monitor it regularly. We encourage people to monitor it at least once a day, maybe twice a day, and control their blood sugar. Now, it's not enough to take uh, insulin or whatever you might be taking for diabetes. 
It takes many other things in order to control blood vessel, uh, blood sugar. It's uh, controlling diet, uh, controlling weight, exercise, regularly monitoring your blood sugar, and keep all your visits with your eye doctors and your primary doctors who monitor your blood sugar level. Um, and so one thing we encourage people is to get their eyes checked once a year, especially diabetics, even if you don't have any eye problems. In fact, in the United States, the government is so serious about it, they will not pay for doctor visit uh, unless the patient has his eyes checked uh, once a year. We, require, we are required to provide documentation for that. Uh, of course, uh, take home message is control your diet, exercise regularly, and quit smoking. All this is very helpful to slow down the process of retinopathy. It doesn't totally stop it, but we are buying time. Okay, next, time, next slide. Okay, so that was a brief view of diabetic retinopathy. Next thing I want to talk about is macular degeneration. A couple of other terms are used to refer to macular degeneration. Uh, AMD and ARMD are abbreviations for age-related macular degeneration. So this is a de problem with the macula. And it's often related to age. Older the patient, higher the risk of getting macular degeneration. Hence, the term age-related macular degeneration. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So what is macular degeneration? So give you some statistics here. There are 200 million people worldwide who have what we call AMD. Usually they are over the age of 50, but can start a little earlier. It's the number one leading cause of permanent loss of vision in U.S. Uh, in patients over the age of 50. So diabetic retinopathy affects mostly patients under the age of 50, over the age of 50, in, at least in the United States. Macular degeneration is the number one cause of blindness. And there are two types. We don't need to get into technical details there. And so we recommend, at least in U.S., people with some risk factors for macular degeneration to get their eyes checked regularly after the age of 40. This is not a question about eyeglasses. It's not that they cannot see well. The ophthalmologist has to look into the eye and look for very early signs of macular degeneration, which I'll show you in the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, uh, before I go to that, so what are the risk factors for AMD? Age, like I said, over the age of 50. Caucasian, especially Northern European ancestries, like from Scandinavian countries, they are somewhat of a higher risk for getting AMD. If there is a family history, you say parents or somebody else in the family has macular degeneration, the family history is important. At least in the U.S., they have found it in increases the risk of AMD by almost 30 times. If a person is a smoker, it increases the risk. Diet is important. That increase, Poor diet. Uh, in, increases the risk, and if the overall health isn't good, uh, high cholesterol levels, uh, excessive weight, all these are risk factors for AMD. But the two most important, or three maybe, is the age, if you are a Caucasian, family history, and smoker, if you are smoking. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So what is AMD, age-related macular degeneration? So here I've got a sequence of photographs to show you the, inside the back of the eye how AMD looks as it develops. So on the left-hand side, we have this is normal eye, normal nerve. This is the macula. It's pretty clean. Nothing is going on. Early stages, I don't know whether you can see it on your screen, but there is very fine tiny dots in the region of the macula. This is the earliest stage of macular degeneration. As those dots get larger, this is how they look. These are known as drusens. That's where the uh, problem is starting. As these get larger over time, and this can take a few years, it does, doesn't happen very quickly, 5, 10, 20 years, Extensive amount of damage is happening here. All the white area in the back you see is damaged retina. 
at some point, some of these, about 5% of these patients who have what is known as dry AMD, start developing those new blood vessels that I talked about in patients with diabetes, similar to that. These new blood vessels are fragile, they break, and they cause bleeding. They start leaking these lipids, fatty stuff that accumulates here. This creates even bigger issue, bigger scars, and bigger loss of vision. So what does the patient see? Well, at the bottom, you can see some pictures here. This kid looks like the left side of the face is distorted. A patient with macular degeneration at this stage, early or intermediate stage, may, may experience that distortion in their vision. As these dots get bigger, they start developing these dark spots in front of their eye. They can't see through that. Now, how do we monitor this? We, do, we use what is known as an Ensler grid, which is, this is the example of this. A normal person would look at this and see very straight lines, vertical, horizontal, with this little black dot in the middle. A patient with macular degeneration will notice distortion in these straight lines. That tells you there is something happening in the macula. This is how we advise our patients who are at risk or have macular degeneration to monitor themselves every single day, once a day at least, and look for this distortion in the straight lines. Okay, let's go to the next one. So, why is this important? So, what's happening in these patients whatever is exactly in front of their eyes is they can't see but anything around it they can see fine now imagine a patient's i'm talking about united states this problem is a patient a problem of the elderly most of them are retired past the age of 70 or 80. what does a retired person do well they want to read. For example, if they try to read, all the words and sentences will be distorted. They can't read. They can't use their cell phone. They can't see very clearly. They're looking at their family members or their children, grandchildren. They can't see their faces clearly. Around that, everything else is clear. They can't do near tasks, like if they want like cooking. They can't see. They, they're afraid. They might hurt themselves. If they're trying to walk on the street, things look a little distorted. They can't drive because these black dots appear in their vision. The side vision is perfectly fine. So they're not totally blind, but the most critical function of their eyes is compromise. And that makes their life very somewhat frustrating. Imagine in the United States, a lot of these elderly people live alone. They have to drive to wherever, even to go to grocery shopping. They can't even write a check, uh, can't look at their bills. Uh, and it gets very frustrating for them. Okay, next slide. So what do we do? So it depends on what stage of macular degeneration we have. I'm going to use this scheme here uh, in, in this slide and the next slide. So we have a patient who we suspect is at risk or has macular degeneration. degeneration. We do the initial testing, figure out what stage it is, whether it's early, or intermediate stage. So if it's early stage, we advise them to alter their lifestyle a little bit, cut out smoking, there are antioxidants, and uh, they're, they're found in seafood, some vegetables, they need to change their diet, limit sun exposure, control blood pressure, lose weight. All this helps to prevent this early stage of macular degeneration from progressing to next stage this is the intermediate stage here so if the patient has what is this is intermediate stage we also advise them to take certain vitamin supplements these vitamin supplements contain vitamin c vitamin e copper zinc lutein and these are antioxidants within the vitamins so these are known as i vitamins that helps to slow down this process of macular degeneration it doesn't totally completely get rid of it. We cannot totally cure macular degeneration. There's no way to undo the damage that's already done, but we want to prevent and stop it from getting worse. So this is the early stage. Let's go to the next slide. So if the macular degeneration is advanced, like I showed you earlier, there is hemorrhage, bleeding, these exudates of fatty stuff, we call this the wet AMD, 
or if this is what is known as uh, geographic atrophy, which is dry, no bleeding, but extensive amount of damage. How do we help these patients? Now, let's look, talk about this wet AMD. As I said earlier, there are new blood vessels causing the hemorrhage. So we want to get rid of those blood vessels for which we give them anti-VEGF injections. These are injections of medications that prevent these new blood vessels from forming there. Uh, and I'll talk about these injections in a minute. There is also some gene therapy to help with that. The, if the patient has geographic atrophy, there really isn't much that we can offer them. This is the newest medication that's available by injections. It slows down this process of extensive scar tissue formation and damage in the back of the eye. At this stage, there is very little we can offer these patients. These create permanent um, issues with their vision. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about these injections. Let's go to the next slide. So there are several types of medications that are available for injections into the eye. And the two most common are these two. Uh, and I just looked up, somebody sent me a little note. In India, these are available. Now, these injections have to be monitored and given very frequently. Uh, that becomes a problem. Next, let's go to the next slide. So, oh, this is just to show you that there is a gene therapy available, uh, not extensively available yet, but that is also helps to retard the growth of the new blood vessels. And this is again given with uh, uh, injections. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the problem with these injections into the eye is they have to be given frequently, often every month, sometimes every two months, Patients end up, and then we don't know where to stop. A year later, two years later, we just don't know. Because if you stop giving the injections, those new blood vessels keep growing. So there's a problem with this. A uh, lot of patients uh, get tired of these injections. They, they are uncomfortable getting the injections. Fortunately, in the United States, a lot of the insurance will pay for these injections. Otherwise, they're expensive. Actually, yesterday I saw this headline in, in India, the Indian Express, and the headline says about these injections, high patient dropout rate, because patients stop getting these injections in anti-VEGF therapy due to unaffordable rates. In India, it costs, I don't know, uh, 5, 10, 50,000 rupees per injection. Uh, and also perceived lack of improvement in vision. This is in India. A lot of patients stop getting the injections. Um, and th that's a problem. So in order to get around this issue about frequent injections, they're now starting to um, insert these reservoirs. These are known as PDS. Uh, reservoir into the eye where they get these injections every six months or maybe once a year. And this has just been approved recently, so I'm not sure how successful this is gonna be. But this will be one way of avoiding the, this, these injections. And we run into this problem if the patient doesn't have an insurance and has to pay out of this pocket, it becomes expensive. But that's the only thing that can be offered to patients who have what is known as wet macular degeneration. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, Patients who cannot be helped with macular degeneration, like I said earlier, they have problem reading. They can't do any near task. There are all kinds of gadgets available to magnify whatever they're looking at. So uh, this is just to show you different types of magnifying lenses um, or gadgets and even computer assisted generated magnification that, that's available to these patients. We often put them through a rehabilitation process for all this. We train them how to use these gadgets and learn to figure out a way to maneuver their life uh, with this problem. For example, this is a telephone here with very large buttons so they can see them easily. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, next we're going to move on to cataracts. And uh, I think everybody in the group is familiar with this. Some of you might have had cataract surgery. So what are cataracts? Let's go to the next slide. Cataract, the term means white uh, in the Latin. So here is the cataract in this patient on the right eye. The left eye has no cataract. You can see it's totally clear lens behind the iris, the colored part. This is an example of a very advanced cataract just to show the contrast so when this patient looks at this scene here looking through the normal eye everything is sharp and clear but looking through that cataract things are fuzzy this is the first thing patients notice they need this things are blurred they are clouded they have problems seeing at night here in the United States everybody has to drive they can't see clearly at night they stop driving they are sensitive to light and glare that bothers them they have trouble reading, they see halos around lights, uh, frequently they have to change their glasses, colors, they cannot appreciate colors, Some, sometimes they see double vision, so all these are problems that interfere with their daily life. The only thing we can do for that is to remove that cataract. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So just to show you, for example, the difference between normal and a cataract. On the right hand side, a person with a clear healthy lens looking at this picture We'll see a woman with glasses, bright colored blue uh, top, colors are vibrant, image is clear. On the left hand side, same image, but looking, up, looking at it through a cataract. It's the same image, you can recognize who the person is, but the colors are totally wrong. There is a glare and um, somewhat distorted. And this can become frustrating. So the only thing we can do is take that cataract out. Let's go to the next slide. Um, oh, who gets cataracts? It is age related. Most of the time, majority of the patient is age related. Um, there is a difference at what age people get cataract. In India, cataracts start around the age of 50. In the United States, we start seeing significant cataract after the age of 70. So it's somewhat related to age, but also to their environment, diet, etc. Patients who are diabetic, cataracts happen earlier. They also get kinds of cataracts that can happen very, very quickly, like within three months. Normally, cataracts take five, ten years before they become significant. Uh, excessive exposure to sunlight, that may be the reason why people in India get cataracts earlier. Smoking, obesity, high blood pressure, injury inflammation, previous surgery. Sometimes if they're on medications like steroids, uh, people take steroids for many reasons. It accelerates the formation of cataracts. Okay, next slide. But the treatment for all of them is the same. You take it out. Cataract was first treated in India 2000, maybe 2500 years ago. Um, and you, so a lot of you might be familiar with this, Shushruta, he did what was known as couching. He would take a needle and push the cataract out of the way. That's all he did. But it restored the sight in that patient. That's how it was treated for about 1500 years. Then a couple of hundred years back, maybe not even that, uh, they started removing the cataract intact surgically. But they had no way of re placing that cataract with the lens. So these patients ended up with these thick lenses, so-called Coke bottle glasses. This is how you might see a lot of patients in India, even now. Uh, they cannot afford the implants, so they end up with these lenses. They work fine, just fine, no problem with this. Then during the Second World War, uh, the, the te plastics technology changed and they developed some polymers and plastics that could be used to make these lenses and implant them inside the eye. So you take the cataract out, that lens has to be replaced. And so they would put this intraocular lens inside the eye. So these patients do not usually don't need glasses to see well, for example, to drive or watch TV, but they would definitely need glasses to read. This is now the standard treatment for cataracts. Uh, let's see the next slide. I'll show you a little bit how it is done. Um, all of you being technology um, oriented will understand this. Uh, this is the type of instrument they use. This is a, called a FACO tip at the top. It's the size of a ballpoint pen. 
the surgeon goes into the eye through a small opening there. This is all done with topical anesthesia. We put drops on the patient's eyes and numb the eye. That's it. Patient is awake, nothing else. Uh, but it is numb. So they enter the eye. This is the cataract here. That cataract is emulsified and aspirated through the same probe. Now this probe uh, looks something like this. It, it creates a jackhammer effect and what is known as cavitation at the tip. Now this is uh, ultrasonic probe, so it vibrates at 40,000 times a second. The temperatures can get as high as 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, but there is a water circulating around the probe constantly to keep the temperature down, otherwise it will burn the tissues. Um, and then the whole cataract is emulsified and aspirated through the same probe. So we clean up that cataract, we leave behind this little bag in which the lens normally is enclosed and into that bag is implanted this artificial lens which is actually folded into another instrument the same size and the lens is implanted into the bag and it unfolds and opens up inside the bag. This is the intraocular lens that now we put in almost every patient and uh, I understand even in India, everybody who gets cataract surgery gets a lens implant. So let's see the next slide to show you what those implants look like. So this is a variety of implants that are available uh, on the market. And they all serve different purposes, they are cost differently. Um, I will not get into the detail. This is the size of that implant. It has what central disc we call an optic and th these are two little loops called haptics. Thus, these loops act like a spring to hold the implant in place inside the eye. The most popular implant probably today, not popular, but um, probably the best implant available in U.S. is this, Vivity, which takes, takes care of your distance vision as well as close-up vision. Now, this, becomes, this has become very important, at least to patients in this country. After cataract surgery, they don't want to wear any kind of glasses. Now, this becomes a problem if the implant is not the right type. Uh, if the implant takes care of distance vision so they can drive and watch TV, there is still a problem. What do you do when you're trying to read or use a computer or a cell phone? You still need glasses. So now they have implants that take care of all of that. The, the technology allows us to do that. These Vivity uh, lenses are probably the best on the market at this point, and things will change in the next few years. There, there are things on the horizon that are even better than that. Uh, the problem here is that most of the insurance companies will pay for the most simplest type of implant, uh, but if somebody wants this Vivity, they, it costs them um, maybe $2,000, per eye out of pocket, and that can become a problem. But I understand all these implants are available in India. Okay, next slide. So the, what's on the horizon as far as implants are concerned? This is, was, this is uh, what is known as extended depth of focus lens. Uh, most likely it will be approved this year in the US, uh, but it serves the same purpose. Um, but it works, uh, optically it works a little bit differently. Again, I will not get into the detail. Another type of implant that's available is light adjustable lens, where you put the implant inside the patient's eye, then apply this UV light over the next two, three weeks to adjust the power of that implant to suit that patient's needs. So it's customized for each individual patient. This is an expensive procedure, so it's not widely used in the U.S. yet. I, I have a feeling that this implant here, the extended depth focus lens, will probably become the most popular in the next five, ten years. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, now one last thing about cataracts. After the cataract is taken out, there is no lens. There is an implant which is clear, but the implant sits in this little bag I said earlier. Sometimes that bag becomes fuzzy over time. About 50% of the patients have this problem. This can happen 
within three months or three years after surgery. So we need to clean up that fuzzy bag in order to restore clear sight. And this can be done fairly easily. People call this a secondary cataract. Sometimes patients will ask me, will the cataract come back? The cataract can never come back, but this complication can happen. And it's very easy to clean that with a YAG laser. It takes five minutes. We clean up that whole thing. At the end of the procedure, the implant looks again crystal clear and patient is able to see clearly. Okay, so much about cataracts. Now let's go to the next uh, thing is glaucoma. This is known as the silent thief of sight. You can read that in Hindi, but this is somewhat of a difficult problem because patients lose their sight, their vision very, very slowly and they are not even aware that it's happening until it's too late. And this is not an uncommon problem I see among patients, especially um, patients coming from India. Uh, I see parents, for example, who, who moved from India to the United States and we find out they had glaucoma, which was never discovered while they were back home because the process happens so slowly and they don't go for an eye checkup regularly like they should, so it, it doesn't get picked up. So what is glaucoma? Let's go to the next slide. So glaucoma damages the optic nerve. This is the nerve in the back of the eye which takes the signals from the macula to the brain. This nerve gets damaged in glaucoma. This is what the nerve looks like when we look into the patient's eyes, a person's eyes in the back. So glaucoma is what we call a collection of disease. There are many reasons why patients get glaucoma, but one thing that happens is that their eye pressure goes up. Now, as this nerve gets damaged, the patients start losing sight vision. Now, this loss of sight vision happens so slowly and gradually that patient is not aware that it's happening. And because they're quite happy, they can see what's exactly in front of them. And a lot of these patients don't drive, they don't do anything else where they require sight vision. They're just not aware. This can happen in one eye or both eyes at the same time until it's too late. And this is an irreversible damage. We cannot turn it back. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I mentioned glaucoma that the pressure in the eyeball goes up. 70% of the people, the pressure in the eyeball increases. So what is the normal pressure in the eye? It's a bell-shaped distribution with a little long tail anywhere between 10 to 20. We consider 20, 21 um, millimeters of mercury as upper normal limit for normal uh, population. Now, that's about 95% of the people, but there are other patients who may have a little lower pressure or higher, but those are outliers. So that's 70% of the patients, the pressure will be high, but in 30%, the pressure may be normal and yet they have glaucoma. So for hundreds of years, we thought this was increased pressure in the eye that was damaging the nerve. That is only a partial truth. The other 30% where the pressure is normal or sometimes even low, why does the nerve get damaged? We don't quite understand that yet. We think the blood circulation around this part of the nerve, something is wrong with that. Or maybe there is some metabolic issue we haven't quite figured out yet. Now, treatment for glaucoma is reduce the pressure. It seems to protect the eyes from further damage. Even the people whose pressure is normal, if you can reduce it by a few points, it protects their nerve. So the treatment is reduce the pressure. Now, in order to understand this, um, then before I show you the next slide, I'm going to show you how the pressure builds up inside the eye. So there is a watery substance called aqueous humor inside the eye. It just circulates inside the eye. It doesn't come out. It's not the same as tears we see in front of the eye. This aqueous humor is synthesized in this part of the eye here called ciliary body. Then it circulates around the pupil and it exits through this little area called trabeculum. 
So there are drugs available, there are uh, laser procedures available, there are surgical procedures available to deal with either reduce the production or increase the outflow of that aqueous humor to control the pressure. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> oh, just a few statistics about glaucoma, 65 million people worldwide, 3 million people in the U.S. The problem in U.S., and this is a problem that exists everywhere, there are another 3 million people who have glaucoma, yet they are not aware of it because they didn't get their eyes checked, nobody has looked at them um, carefully. Quite a bit more common among African Americans. Now, there are some other risk factors, such as age, so older the patient, higher the incidence of glaucoma, uh, race, family history. If there is one member in the family has glaucoma, chances are another member might get glaucoma. We are very careful about screening for that. Medical conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, eye injury, if you're nearsighted, if you're on some medications such as steroid, all these increase your risk for glaucoma. And there is some genes that also increase your risk. Okay, next slide. So what does glaucoma do? I mentioned earlier, it takes away your sight vision. Just to emphasize that point, you look at this sequence of pictures here, at the top is completely normal eye, looking at that scene. This is his second frame is a picture of a patient, what he sees with very early glaucoma. He can still see what's in front of him, but he's starting to lose sight vision. This is patient with fairly advanced glaucoma. If the vision becomes a tunnel vision, but can't see anything on the side, eventually leads to blindness. <clears throat> As it progresses through that, several activities of daily life get affected, starting with reading, simple tasks such as shopping, mobility, just walking around, or even driving. All important activities of life slowly get affected. It happens very gradually. The patient is just not aware of this. Okay, next, go <coughs> next slide. So, how do we diagnose glaucoma? It's very, very critical for an experienced eye doctor to look into your eyes to diagnose glaucoma. And that's what gets missed. Here, and then we do several other tests. I mentioned the eye pressure goes up. So we, how do we check eye pressure? Here, for example, we are checking the eye pressure of this patient. Uh, we look into the eye, Here, that's what this shows. And this is what we're looking for. This is the nerve in the back of the eye we are looking for. This is normal. This is a patient with glaucoma where we are seeing the damage. It, it's, this white circle gets bigger and bigger. Uh, we take some other measurements, the thickness of the front part of the eye. We look at that angle where the aqueous humor inside the eye uh, gets out of the eye. Then there are additional tests. These tests tell us how much damage has happened to that nerve. This is what is known as a field analyzer which tests how much of the side vision has been lost. So this is how we come to a conclusion, patient has glaucoma. So what do we do? Next slide. <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier, you control the pressure. Treatment for glaucoma is lower the eye pressure by any means you can. So we start with the eye drops. So I mentioned earlier, the production happens here, the outflow happens here. If we can control these two factors, we can control the pressure. So usually we start with drops, and there are drops that can do one or both of these, either decrease the production or increase the outflow. And we try to balance this. There are at least eight, 10 different types of drops. Some patients do well with one drop, one drop a day, every night. Some patients require three, four, five drops a day uh, to control this. If that doesn't work, we do laser. We actually, laser is given to this part of the eye to increase the outflow. And if that doesn't work, there is surgery. And I'll show you next picture what the surgery involves. Okay, so eye drops. There are a variety of these eye drops, which can decrease production or increase the outflow of the aqueous humor. And a lot of patients do well. <clears throat> next slide. <clears throat> now I mentioned uh, surgical procedures to improve the outflow and there are various types of surgical procedures. 
here is an example of a valve that's placed on the outside of the eyeball with a plastic tubing extending into the eye and this there is a valve in here that controls how much of that aqueous flow uh, gets out through this valve. On the other hand, we can improve the outflow inside the eye by placing these stents. There are various types of stents that can be placed surgically inside the eye <coughs> to improve the outflow. And actually, we are doing more and more of this procedure when we do a cataract surgery in a patient. A lot of patients with cataract have also glaucoma or glaucoma patients have cataract. They need cataract surgery. When we do the cataract surgery, at the same time, we implant these stents inside the eye to control their eye pressure. One problem with eye drops is patients get tired of putting their uh, drops in their eyes. Sometimes they forget. Um, it might be expensive for the patients to buy. Um, and so they don't work very well. So these type of stents are helpful because then they don't have to use the drops after that. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that was about glaucoma and I was just gonna stop there um, and talk about some of the questions people have sent me. Um, and one person had asked me about retinitis pigmentosa. So while the slide is on the screen, I'll walk you, talk through this, okay? And then we'll stop and take up your questions. So um, someone said, uh, in the family, there's a member with retinitis pigmentosa. So what is retinitis pigmentosa? Um, if you recall earlier, I mentioned there are 120 million rods and 6 million cones inside our eye in the retina. The rods, 120 million, are responsible for our night vision or when there is not enough light. In retinitis pigmentosa, those photoreceptors get damaged. So in low light situation, patients start having problems seeing. So they start with poor night vision. At night, if this is what a normal person sees, a patient with retinitis pigmentosa will think it's a very dark night. Maybe it's not. It's just their photoreceptors have been damaged. Eventually, they will also start losing sight vision. And eventually, they can get totally blind. So that's the extent of it. Next slide. Um, retinitis, early signs, decrease night vision, loss of sight vision, late symptoms can all the way to blindness. How do you diagnose this? Of course, family history is very important. If one family member has it, the rest of the family should be checked by an experienced eye doctor. Uh, they look into the eye and there are several kinds of tests they can do for that. Uh, treatment really at this point there is no treatment for retinitis pigmentosa. We have ways of helping patients preserve this or slow down the process, um, but there's no permanent treatment for retinitis pigmentosa at this time. So there are low vision aids, vision rehabilitation is what we might use. Next slide. Um, just to show you what retinitis pigmentosa looks like to us when we look into the eye, here's the normal eye. This is the macula, and this we see these pigmented uh, areas uh, as the retina gets damaged. Let's go to the next slide. So, to prevent further vision loss in retinitis pigmentosa, we encourage several steps. They will slow the process down, doesn't necessarily stop it. So, avoid place with too much light, night vision goggles, low vision aids, color filters, all kinds of things. Foods rich in antioxidants, dairy products, fish oils, uh, avoid fatty foods, sunglasses, exercise, wear protective eyewear. But none of this will get rid of the retinitis pigmentosa. It just slow it down maybe. Okay, next one. <clears throat> and there are about 30 different varieties of retinitis pigmentosa and they are not all the same. Uh, vitamin A is supposed to help in small amounts, not excessive amount of vitamin A because excessive amount of vitamin A can be toxic to other parts of the body. This is all under investigation. Um, I don't think any of this is widely available, even in the United States. Uh, it's, the availability is limited. Only few medical centers do this, and it's not open to all of the public. 
Next slide, I want to show you what this prosthesis look like. Oh, this is just to uh, investigate your treatment of retinitis pigmentosa. It's the gene um, injections. Okay, next slide. And these are the prosthetic devices still under investigation, not available to the public, um, but they seem to work. Um, it's interesting, uh, what they do is they implant this um, array of micro into the eye in the back where the macula is, is connected um, to these goggles. There's a little camera here that takes the picture of whatever the person is looking at. Um, this is the battery here. Uh, it, this and I, I can't read it, but it it processes that video signal from that camera, converts that into radio frequency waves that are then transmitted um, to this the um, receiver antenna around the eyeball, which is connected to this area of micro electrodes inside the eye. And from there, the signal goes to the brain. It allows the patient to see something, not necessarily to see normally. The patient might see shadows, but may not be able to recognize what those shadows are, but it's better than nothing. This is still under investigation, not widely available. So just wanted to throw that out. I think that's a lot, okay? Uh, first set of questions was about retinal detachment. <clears throat> Is it hereditary? Now, uh, the answer is yes and no. If a family or patient has some hereditary conditions which predisposes them to renal detachment, the answer is yes. For example, patients who are very nearsighted <clears throat> and sometimes that runs in the family, that increases the risk for retinal detachment, but not generally. Um, in UK and Europe, they have identified some genes that says patients with those genes have higher risk, uh, but I don't know whether that applies to every other country. Um, if yes, how can this be avoided? What all precautions do I need to take? The key thing is to talk to a local eye doctor who is experienced about this, usually a retina specialist. You know, one thing I will tell you, India, we have excellent eye doctors. That's good or better than ophthalmologist is here. See, you have access to those doctors in India. So if you have access to one of them, have one of them check you out. And they will give you the information that you need. Okay. So I would encourage, if you have that question, doubt, go to a good eye doctor and go from there. Okay. It's very hard to give a general answer. Can too much screen time be a problem? Well, yes, uh, you, we all use a screen of one type or another. Right now we are using a computer screen. We use uh, cell phones, you know, all the time. <clears throat> and so is that a problem? That is a problem. And the major problem with screen time is uh, our eyes get dry. And that causes a lot of problems, it causes discomfort, causes blurriness. You feel like there's something in your eye constantly, tiredness, headaches. The problem is, even as I'm looking at this screen in front of me, my eyes don't blink like they should normally blink because we are concentrating on the screen. Our eyes normally blink maybe 20 times a minute. When I'm looking at the screen, maybe I'm blinking 10 times a minute. It's not enough. Every time we blink, we are spreading moisture around the eye. So if your eye is not blinking, it's exposed to air and it gets dry. And you do that for six, eight, ten hours a day, and a lot of people have to do it at work, for example. They get tired. Eyes get dry. That is the main problem. Plus, the light uh, from the screen will also accelerate dryness. Okay, so it creates fatigue. And the other thing that happens, especially in younger people in their 20s, 30s, they have to focus to see whatever they are looking at on the screen. And they do a lot of data processing. And they use a very small font size. <clears throat> and so they have to focus. And that can create what we call a <clears throat> spasm. The eye muscles get tired. And that induces more symptoms of tiredness, headache, 
uh, irritation. So we encourage people to follow the 20-20-20 rule. I don't know, you might have heard about it, which says every 20 minutes approximately, turn your eyes away from the screen and look at something that's 20 feet away. You relax your eyes for about 20 seconds. And that helps. So you don't necessarily have to do it 20, 20, 20, but frequent breaks. I tell my patients, just get up and walk away. Look through the window. Don't even look at your cell phone. You need to let your eyes relax, blink a few times, go to get a glass of water, do something. That helps. Uh, there are computer glasses people use, um, and that can be helpful. They are usually yellow tinted lenses that blocks the blue light coming from the screen. Um, and um, there are screens available for the, um, for the screen itself, the t uh, computer screen. These are things that can help you. Can this next question was, can sitting too close to the TV hurt your eyes? Well, I, this is a common issue with kids, children. They like to sit close. That doesn't, again, but they run into the same issue. If they're looking at something on a screen, you run into the same issue about dryness and tiredness of your eye muscles. But it doesn't cause any permanent damage if that's what we are looking for. Can sunlight give you cataracts? Like I mentioned earlier, um, in India we get cataracts earlier because there's prolonged exposure to sunlight. That's supposed to be responsible for that. So in a way the answer is yes. Do carrots really improve your sight? Um, that is the myth about carrots, not really. Carrots, you cannot eat, eat enough carrots to do anything about your eyes. Carrots provide carotene. We need vitamin A in, the, uh, in our body. There's plenty of vitamin A in everything else we use, uh, eat, especially dairy products, fruits and vegetables. Eating extra carrots is not going to help. So I'm not sure where that came from, but uh, the answer is not really. Do you need to get your eyes checked more frequently as you age? And this is, the answer is yes. Um, here in the United States, every child that is in lower school around the age of six or eight, their eyes get screened at the school. And we pick up a lot of kids who have eye problems, but the kids are not aware of it. They don't complain until they're 10, 12, 15 years old. Same thing applies to older patients, adults. Get your eyes checked if you're under the age of 40, at least every five years, by a qualified professional. Not for eyeglasses, for some other problems. After the age of 40, I would say maybe every three years, because your bifocal power is going to change every two years. You need stronger and stronger bifocal power as you age, after the age of 40. So you need an eyeglass adjustment anyway. Get your eyes checked. If you are older than 60, I would say at least every two, maybe every year. Because you're going to get cataract, you might be getting glaucoma, you don't know if macular degeneration is starting. If you have diabetes, diabetes at any age, get your eyes checked once a year. Sometimes we check their eyes every six months. If we are, if, if we are concerned something is happening, every three months it's important before it gets too late because we want to fix the problem. Do I have a risk for eye disease based on age, ethnicity, family history, etc.? Again, the answer is yes. Depends on what eye disease we are talking about. For example, cataract and glaucoma is a macular degeneration, somewhat age related. If you have a family history of glaucoma, um, there is a higher risk or macular degeneration, there is a higher risk for those problems. Ethnicity, I don't know. Not sure about that. In the United States, we know the African Americans have a higher risk for uh, glaucoma. Um, as I mentioned earlier, people uh, from northern Scandinavian countries have a higher risk for macular degeneration. I don't know how this applies to patients in India, I'm not quite sure. Uh, if I'm at risk for certain eye conditions, what can I do to lower or manage that risk? Again, it depends on what the 
condition is. But a regular checkup by an experienced eye doctor is essential. Okay? That, that's a key. What are the treatment options for my vision loss or eye problems? Again, I don't know what vision loss is, what's responsible for vision loss or what the problem is. So it's a very general question. I don't know the answer to that. I said it depends. Are there any medications I should avoid given my eye condition? So again, I don't know what the eye condition is, but there are some medications that we screen the eyes for. For example, patients who are taking steroids. People take steroids for autoimmune problems. Sometimes they take it for asthma, things like that. Their eyes need to be checked regularly. They can get glaucoma, they can get cataracts. The two things we worry about. Um, there are some medications for things like arthritis that can cause permanent toxicity damage to the eye. We screen their eyes once a year. Okay? One medication I think of what we call Plaquenil here is hydroxychloroquine is related to the medicine we take for malaria. It's the same group. It can cause permanent damage in the eye. So at least in this country, we screen these patients once a year regularly. Okay. Um, Can macular degeneration be reversed? The answer is no, it's permanent, but we can slow it down, like I mentioned. What is central serous retinopathy? Causes and treatment. Now, we, I didn't talk about this. This is what we call CSCR, central serous retinopathy. Uh, we don't know the cause. Uh, but it's a, it's a problem where there's accumulation of fluid inside the back of the eye, in the macula. Why it happens, we don't know. We know certain things about it. Um, it can affect one or both eyes. It causes blurriness and distortion. It can happen very quickly, just overnight. You wake up with it, okay? Majority of these patients are male. And one thing that is common in them, among many of them, they're under a lot of stress. And they are type A personalities who develop this problem. Okay? Um, if they are on steroids, another complication of steroids. Um, if they have any autoimmune disease, they can get central serous. If they have insomnia, they can. People with insomnia may be under stress. Maybe that's the reason they get central serous. Treatment for this. Uh, often we just watch it. We don't do anything. Two, three months, usually it resolves the majority of those patients. But if it doesn't, then there is a laser treatment. Uh, there are some injections we can give to promote uh, for that fluid to go away. Um, okay, let me see, find the questions. Okay. Uh, okay, this was a question about macular degeneration. And this person has it since the age of, no, uh, since 2016, uh, taking Acetrix injection. Now that's a trade name that's used in India. I think it is the same as what we call Renibuzem map in this country. Those are injections. Um, but like I said earlier, you have to take those injections as needed. Sometimes every month, every two months, but if you can get that reservoir, then you take those injections every six months, maybe even every 12 months. Uh, is there no other solution to this problem? There is no oral medication for macular degeneration. And so injection is the only way. Can there be any exercises of the eye? The exercises will not help macular degeneration. Now, this next question, is it salutary to look at the rising sun? And if yes, for how long? Honestly, I don't know the answer to this. Um, in India, there is a tradition, what do you call this? Surya something in the morning. People do that, right? Surya Namaskar. Surya, yeah, Surya Namaskar. So, honestly, I don't know the answer to this. I looked up and Everything I saw says there is not enough research to answer this question. Is it helpful or not? Reading about it, I realized it does one thing. It gives you uh, 
uplifts you spiritually and emotionally, maybe that's the benefit. But as far as the eyes go, <laughs> and we need that, as far as the eyes go, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay? Now, um, sunlight is important for synthesizing vitamin D in our body. Okay? But that's not the sunlight you want early morning. That's the sunlight middle of the day. Because those light rays are concentrated, they're strong. That's what's helpful. But early morning sunlight or in the evening, that's not going to help you synthesize vitamin D. Vitamin D gets synthesized in the skin. So we need that exposure. Indians uh, and a lot of white people in this country, they have vitamin D deficiency because they are not outside enough. Unlike Ajit who plays golf six hours a day every day, he has no problem. <laughs> he has enough exposure to sunlight. But a lot of us are indoor people. We don't get exposed to sunlight. So we have to take vitamin D supplement. But as far as the eyes go, I don't think there is enough research or data to say it's helpful or not. Actually, on the other hand, excessive sunlight can be damaging. Like I mentioned, in case of cataract, macular degeneration, it can be harmful. So you don't want to overdo it. Uh, one question is that even young kids and people in their 40s are getting uh, cataract early in life. So why is that? And is surgery the only answer? What is the life of these lenses, which is connected to cataract? Okay. Cataracts, okay. In children, let me talk about children first. Yeah. Children can be born with cataracts, okay? It has nothing to do with their age. So when children get cataract, there's something, either they have a genetic problem, metabolic problem, some other systemic reason why they get cataracts, or they may be, they were born with cataracts. It's not unusual. We see a lot of kids with cataracts at birth, five-year-olds. If they develop later, when they're 10, 15, 20 years old, there has to be some other health issues. And so the pediatrician or the doctor needs to check that out. And there's a whole list of things that can do that. That's kids. In adults, like I said, most of the people start getting cataracts around the age of 50, depending on where you live. It can happen earlier. Most common reason for that is diabetes. And so that needs to be checked out. So cataract is a sign that something else is going on in the body. They may have an autoimmune disease. They may be taking some medication that promotes cataract formation. So anybody younger than age 40, go to a good doctor and get a good physical checkout. And sometimes we never find a reason, but it's unusual. Trauma can do it. Any kind of injury can give cataract, can cause cataract. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> what are the risks associated with cataract surgery? And what are the recovery measures available for them? Okay, cataract surgery, okay. Um, let me preface the answer and say the most common surgery done worldwide is cataract surgery. In the United States last year, we did about 5 million cataract surgeries. In India, maybe it's 15 <clears throat> million. I don't know. It's a very common operation. So the risk is somewhat relative to your volume. Yes, there are, we, when we see a patient with cataract, we go through a long list of potential problems, complications that can happen. And they have to sign off on it and say, yeah, I agree, I understand. So starting from surgical complications, something just doesn't go right. You know, remember that I showed you that phaco tip, the probe, things can go wrong, okay? Chances are very small. The implant are permanent. I have patients who have had the implant for 40 years, 50 years, they don't change. It's an inert plastic material. It stays there. Now, um, so as far as that goes, the lifespan of the implant is indefinite. Um, sometimes the wrong implant gets implanted in the patient's eyes. And that's a big problem in this country. When we do cataract surgery here, everybody expects a perfect result. No glasses after the cataract surgery. They want to be able to drive, watch TV, do computers, cell phone. Well, that's perfection. Uh, a little bit unrealistic, but we are getting there. So, 
across the other part of the question.